friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I am with Inspire Ministries and I'm so glad that you are here with me today. Today I'm going to be doing a Bible study with me video. Now, it's going to be something in the scriptures that you've likely heard this story before, but I want you to go with me on a journey today through kind of like an explanation if you will, of the text, how I saw it, how God brought it to me, and how I believe we have every bit of reason to examine, to look at closer, and to think about how we can adopt so many of these truths in our own life as it relates to our faith. So if you are ready for a Bible study with me video, go get yourself your Bible, a drink, a pen, a pad of paper, a journal, or something to write with and on, and meet me back here as we dive in the book of Acts together today. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and if you are not new to Bible study, you've probably read it before. If not, you've probably read it a few times before. The likelihood is you've probably heard sermons on it, maybe you've read books on it, and the likelihood is if you are in your Bible and you've been in the New Testament, you've probably heard at least about Ananias and Sapphira. Again, it's probably a story that you are familiar with, maybe you're not, or you know, maybe you have simply just heard about it and you would like to know more about it. So today we are going to investigate that story in its entirety. I will warn you that this is going to be a longer video and it is going to be one that is going to require some deep dive and probably further investigation after we have completed this video, but I want to invite you in to this journey with me today. It's one that I have been looking over in scripture a lot of times. I've been running into Ananias and Sapphira, not just in the book of Acts, but I've been running into their story as I have studied other places in scripture. And today, I want to show you a deeper look at this portion of text and challenge you to think about something that you might not have thought about until today. So today, we are going to be in the book of Acts chapter 5. So again, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me and turn to that really quick. Now, just before the portion of text that we are going to be reading today, again, to set up some context for you, just before this, we see what is happening in the church in that day. Now, we have the preaching of the apostles that was spreading far and wide, and we see Peter and John bravely and boldly preaching the word of God to the people. And we see also, the scripture tells us, according to chapter 4, verse 32, that all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they had owed was not only their own, but they would share everything that they had. Now, while they were not ordered to do this, this was not a requirement of the church, it was a common shared feeling among the believers of that day that they would share naturally everything that they had, including income, including livestock, and including food. And then scripture tells us this in chapter 4, verses 34 through 30. I want to read it to you out of the English Standard Version, and it says this, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses, they sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. It was said that there was a man named Barnabas, and the scripture tells us, for instance, there was a man named Joseph, the one the apostles had nicknamed Barnabas, which meant the son of encouragement. Now, he was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned, and he brought the money to the disciples. So we see the example, a positive example, being laid out before us in chapter 4. Now, it seemed to be that this was becoming a regular practice of the believers in this day, which helped aid in the preaching of the good news. And then we come to this story of Ananias and Sapphira, and as is the case with Luke, who was the one recording the words of this story, he uses this technique in balancing a positive example with a negative example, which we see here in a read-through of this remarkable story. So I want to read with you through the book of Acts chapter 5. So again, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Acts chapter 5. And the first 
beginning portion of that I want to read to you, and that is verses 1 through 11. And so let's just go ahead and read here what the text says. Again, Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and it says this, But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought some of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Verse 3, Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Verse 5, as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Uh, then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out to bury him. Verse 7, about three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. Verse 9, and Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Verse 10, instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone who heard what had happened. So I want to kind of review some of the key points in this story. We have this man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And because it was this known practice and it was this agreed on practice among the believers, it was thought that any land that someone would sell, that whole entire profit that they made from selling that land would go to the entire church as one ginormous congregation. But that wasn't the case with Ananias and Sapphira. What they did is they sold some property, they kept some money to themselves, and then they gave the money in portion to the disciples. What they did in addition to doing that is that they had lied and they said that it was the full amount that they received. So they were not truthful in what they had done. And what happened in this story is that because of their unfaithfulness and because of their disobedience, they both dropped dead. And what scripture tells us is that fear gripped the entire church. Now, the word fear here is this Greek word phobos, and it means terror or alarm. It also means reverence and respect. Now, earlier in the book of Acts, we read that the numbers of the church were being added to daily. Now, this is probably something that you've heard before. It's definitely something that we all have heard probably in teachings within our church is that numbers were added to the disciples every day. One place that we see this is Acts chapter 2 verses 46 and 47. It says they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. We see it again in Acts 2, verse 41. It records the specific number of people who were being added. It says this, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. And so we get a specificity of number. And yet here we see that although Ananias and Sapphira had indeed been one of those numbers who had been added to the church, they had been simply added to the church, not added to the Lord. And that is what I want to talk to you specifically about today. Had they been added to the Lord as genuine, authentic, Bible-believing, Jesus-fearing people, believers, they would have been convicted by the Spirit not to behave in the way that they did. And the truth be told here, it wasn't just the congregation of believers that they were betraying here. It was the Spirit of God that they were disobeying, 
that they were distrusting and that they were double-crossing. And there would be a price to pay. We see it when they both drop dead in a single day. Now, my commentary says that it is the falsehood in the world that is often the great barrier in the way of the church. And that's another thing that we want to talk about today. We see warnings all over the New Testament of false teachers in the church, and we are equally warned against false believers in the church that bring corruption, impurity, and ultimate judgment on the people of God. Let's look at some scriptures where it outlines these specific things. The first one is Ephesians 5, 6, and it says this in the NLT. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, out of the English Standard Version, says this. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. In speaking of hypocrites, Jesus says these words in Matthew 15, 8, out of the New King James Version. He says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Let's take a look at Titus 1, 15 through 16. In the NLT, it says this, Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and their consciences are corrupted. Such people claim that they know God, but they deny Him by the way that they live. They are detestable, he says, and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. And then let's take a look at 1 John 3, 8. Out of the New International Version, it says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And then one more place that we see this spelled out for us in the scriptures is found in 1 Timothy 6, 4 through 5, and it says this, He is proud, knowing nothing, but he is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, evil, suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth who suppose that godliness is only a means of gain. And then it follows up with this, only found in the original King James text, and it says this, from such, withdraw yourself. And it's this warning that we are given when we read this story. Now, I want to continue for a minute and read through verses 12 through 16, and then I want to talk about what it is that we read. Now, continuing on, after these two individuals, Ananias and Sapphira, have died, it says this, The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Verse 15, as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and their possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Now, there are some very key things that I want to look at in these specific scriptures. Now, remember, the membership of the church was being added to daily. We've already established that. Miracles were attracting people at record number. Healings were captivating the people at warp speed. And both were serving to fascinate the people, charm them into the church doors in droves. And the Lord had to do something about what could and would negatively influence the church, compromising its purity and reducing the effectiveness in a generation. And here we see the devastating effect of error brought into the church caused by selfishness, pride, arrogance, misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit, and genuine misuse of Christian responsibilities by means of church inclusion. 
Here we see God had to put a halt to things for a bit to stop unbelievers from rushing into the church where miracles were more wanted than the presence of Jesus was. Where what God could do for them mattered more than what could be produced and reproduced in them through the miracle of Jesus Christ. So I want us to look at this story a bit differently than we have traditionally. And I want us to think about three different things as we go through today's study. The first one is the profanity of the people of God, the purification in the household of God, and the protection by the hand of God. Number one today I want to talk to you about is the profanity of the people of God. In this story, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, we can see how easily profanity can enter into the hearts proclaiming to belong to Christ. My commentary says this, church membership combined with practical irreligion shows a conscience that's asleep. The call on us when we give our lives to King Jesus is found in Ephesians 5.14. Now, out of the NLT, it says this, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is the calling on our life as believers, to wake up. And that way, once we are awake, we can be given the light of Christ. When we give our hearts to Christ, Jesus says in John 8, 12, out of the New Living Translation, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a verse that I am constantly going back to here on my channel, it says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. In Colossians 2.12, it says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And these are all found out of the New Living Translation. So again, although Ananias and Sapphira were added to the church, they were never added faithfully and truly to the kingdom of God. And as a result, they died premature spiritual and physical physical deaths. Now, part of the reason that we see the profanity in the people of God is because they just don't know. Now, I have a story about this. My best friend and I, years ago, started this conversation, and I would get frustrated over things that I would see on social media. I would say, man, I'm so sick and tired of seeing these lies from professing believers online, where one day they're posting a Bible verse and talking about how they love Jesus, and the very next day, they're compromising their Christian character by belittling the president and by posting all kinds of nonsense. And I would get very frustrated as a teacher of the scriptures would. And I would get very frustrated and I would have these conversations with my friend and I would say, I just am so disheartened. And I remember the words of my best friend. She was so sweet and she would respond back to me and she'd say, Wendy, I just don't think that they know. And I would argue with that. And I would say, oh yes, they do know. They do know because they sit in church every week and because they listen to the scriptures through teaching on Online and because they read the Bible and because they're studying the Word of God and because they're faithful followers of Jesus, of course they know these things. But the reality is, many don't. Yes, they sit in a pew on a Sunday morning in church, but they're not told truth. Yes, they're following online ministers and pastors who really don't know the scriptures well enough themselves to be duplicating it to the world around them. So the truth of the matter is, they just don't know. And I want to suggest to you today that it is possible for you and I and for any of us to be deceived even in the best intentions, even when we are sitting in church and even when we are listening to people who have a good reputation on our social media platforms. The truth is that many just don't know. And because of this, there is this low general standard of living, I believe, that we see a among believers, and we see it all the time. Christians, or so-called Christians, living with a very low, watered-down, superficial understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says this out of the NIV, If my people, God says, 
If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will come and heal their land. Matthew 6.33 out of the New Living Translation says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. The fact of the matter is we miss that second half a lot of times. We read it as seek the kingdom of God above all else. And surely there are Christians or so-called Christians who would think that they're doing this well. But it's the second part that always gets me, and that's the part that says, and live righteously. Listen, we may think that we are striving after finding Jesus, seeking Jesus, and pursuing Jesus. But when it comes to living righteously, we have a long way to go. I want to read you Mark 12 verse 20 out of the Amplified Version. It says this, And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, parentheses, life, and with all your mind, parentheses, thought and understanding, and with all of your strength. My commentary goes on to say, Human nature has a wonderful power in counterfeiting religion assisted by the devil. That's too good for me not to read again. Second time through, this is what it says. Human nature has a wonderful power in counterfeiting religion assisted by the devil. And can I be honest with you when I say that this is what we are seeing in our modern culture today? Not only are we seeing a watered-down Christianity that serves no good purpose to the world that we live in, we are witnessing a counterfeit Christianity producing godless people being helped by the devil himself to carry out his destructive plan for our nation. The less Christ-like people are, the more manipulated people become by counterfeit ideas, like the acceptance of the transgender movement, a deadening conscience to our societal madness that is Pride Month, and the general acceptance of sins that break God's heart, like idolatry, complaining, premarital relations, and the disorder or the upset of the family unit. By contrast, the more Christ-like people are, the less easily it is to be counterfeited because detection is most likely. And can I say this too? Self-denial, being generally greater, is not likely to be practiced by people who are so-called Christians in our churches today. Self-denial is the antithesis of worldly men and women. I mean, just look at the self-love movement that we are living in still today in the 21st century. Look at everything in our evil, social media-driven world. Everything aimed at, centered around, and highlighted to self. It is all about self-promotion. What I can do, what I can see, what I can show, what I can demonstrate in my life, who's looking at me, and what kind of voice that I can have in the world around me. And the gospel message, listen, the gospel message is anything but selfish theology. Therefore, the pure and the true church will not be joined by worldly people. It can't be because when you are living for self, when you are living a worldly way and you enter into a purified church, one that is seeking after holiness for the people that reside within it, the worldliness cannot coexist with godliness. It will offend their hearts, those who are living in the world. It will offend their hearts because it promotes such selfish living. So that means when you go into a church that is vocalizing their opposition of the pride movement and you walk in, you are offended by that. The reason why you carry that offense, the reason why you are offended, can I be honest with you? It might sting a little bit. The reason why you are offended by that is because you are living too attached to the world. 
And what happens is when you enter into that place carrying that sinful attitude, carrying the way that you have justified sinful living in our world that we live in here in the 2023 world that we live in, your hearts are offended because what is being promoted within that organization is selfless living and it flies in the face of worldly living. Those two realities cannot coexist. The truth is that the real church and real believers are hated by the world in proportion to their purity. That means the the more that there are godly people that reside within a church who are holding on to purity and who are seeking after righteous living and holy living, and they are seeking more and more to be set apart because that's what God demands from them, the more that the world will hate them because they look nothing like them. It is a completely foreign concept and because The world can't coexist with the purity of the church. In John 15, 19, Jesus says this in the NLT. He says, The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so naturally the world hates you. The key is it's in proportion to how pure the people in that church are. There is sinfulness in seeking to make Christianity pleasing to the world. I just believe this with everything in me. And we see this oftentimes in our seeker-sensitive churches. You see, we long to be loved and welcomed and accepted in our society, in the world. And in the attempt at doing this, what we do, our seeker-sensitive churches do, is we make a watered-down gospel that is devoid of any depth. Thus, what we do is we produce people who are watered-down, who not only don't know what being a true disciple of Christ is, but then certainly will never properly replicate that pattern of godliness in the world to others who are genuinely hungry and in need of Jesus Christ. In fact, a simple side note concerning a seeker-sensitive church is that here in the 21st century, it's not truly a biblical concept. Why? I want to be honest with you and tell you this because no one in their natural, sinful, me-centered state actually seeks after God. They don't. Look at Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. It says this, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, and that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. The New King James says it in part this way, that they grope to find him. And so we grope to find God, but we do not pursue after him. We do not seek him because nothing in our sinful man would choose Jesus Christ. People don't naturally seek after God because it's not part of the design of our human, sinful, depraved self. Jeremiah 29 says that we will find him when we seek him, but that we have to do so with our whole hearts. And many don't do this. Instead, we seek miracles and signs and wonders. We seek comfort and peace and happiness. We seek answers to the why question that is often never answered this side of eternity. And we seek pleasures and justification to live as close to the edge as we can without losing our salvation. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says this, As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. You see, God is the pursuer of our hearts, and you need to understand that. He is the wooer and the pursuer of your heart. 
John 6, says this out of the New Living Translation, for no one can come to me, Jesus, unless the Father, God, who sent me, Jesus, draws them to me. Since the very beginning of creation, God has been the pursuer and the instigator of love. Look at Genesis 3.8 out of the New Living Translation. It says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And this is Adam and Eve. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. It was always God from the very beginning who was the pursuer of men and women. And we see it in the parable of the lost sheep. We see the heart of God through the life of Jesus who rejoices, saying that when he finds one lost one, one lost soul who didn't belong to him, Luke 15, 6 out of the NLT says, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I have found the lost sheep. Jesus is the one here in this story who is the pursuer. Our Lord is the one who pursues. We do nothing but faithfully and wholeheartedly respond to that wooing and the pursuing. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is number two, and that is the purification of the household. This is what we are seeing in this place here, is not just the punishment of the people who refuse to obey, but it is the purification of the household of God. Now, this is what the Lord is seeking after in the church purification. The word itself, by definition, means this, the act of making something pure and free of any contaminating, debasing, or foreign elements. It's the act of making something free from guilt or evil. It's a process that we see all over the Old Testament, the ritual of purification usually done in order that people will be made right with the Lord. It's in order to hear his voice and see his work and experience his presence. Now, in the New Testament, it's found meaning the same thing in light of Christ's sacrifice. Take a look at 1 John 3, 3. It says this, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. James 4, 8 out of the ESV says this, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And it is said of God in Hebrews 12, 29, that he is a consuming fire, meaning that through him is this purification process of God. But our church, our capital C church, thinks nothing of this process. We have completely done away with this in our capital C church. And instead, what we see is that the Ananias and Sapphira of our day exists. And there's not only zero discipline for it, there is wicked acceptance of it. In fact, in some instances, it's not only just tolerated, but it's celebrated. We say things like, well, good for you not letting the church control you and judge you like that. Oh, how we have strayed far away from the original design of ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church. You and I have been called to live lives set apart for the glory of God. This is what it means to be purified, to be set apart for his good use and his good pleasure. And part of that is the acceptance into a church. We are protected in a body of believers because it is the church that is to be purified. We can see this concept in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. When God finally granted the walls of Jericho to fall on the seventh day, and believing that they would, the people of God were given a direct order, and the order was this, found in Joshua 6, verses 16 through 17. The order was, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to God. 
Then between verses 18 and 19, we see this said to the people by the Lord. He says this, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. There were things in this evil nation that had to be destroyed because of the wickedness that they carried within them. And then there was these things that were to be set apart for God, these things that were to be brought into the treasury of the Lord and preserved for his greater use. So we have two different things, one, the things that needed to be destroyed and one, things that needed to be preserved. You and I are those things that are described as being made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron. We are the ones who are, quote, sacred to the Lord, unquote, and need then to be separated from evilness and wickedness within the worldly possessions that were to be destroyed. We are those ones who have been set apart by God to be purified by him in the world but not of the world, the ones who still need to practice their obedience to God among the evil and corruption in our day without being tainted because our focus is on being purified by Christ. We are the ones set apart by God for God. And we are, friends, to look nothing like the world around us. Jesus says this awful thing to his brothers while they were trying to entice him and invite him to do something that was not within his will or the will of his father to do. What Jesus says is the complete opposite of that which he would say to his disciples, and we find it in John 7, 7. He says this to his biological brothers. He says, the world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. And that's the thing, right? Oftentimes we go into these churches where we would consider them to be judgmental. And really what they're doing is saying, listen, we are people who are set apart for the purposes of God. We are purified. We are keeping ourselves in a righteous standing before the Lord. And we will not accept or tolerate these evils among us. And the world hates us because we take that stand. But because we take that stand and because we are hated, we are made right by God because they hated him too. They hated our Lord Jesus when he was here and he walked among us for three years. When the church is declared credible and godly, there is a judgment, or at least there should be. There is to be a significant difference in the way that the world looks and the way that the church looks. There should be this vast difference between us and them. And that takes me to number three, is the protection by the hand of God. So let's go back and talk through what we have just covered in our lessons so far. The first one was the profanity of the people of God. Number two, again, was the purification in the household of God. And then number three, the protection by the hand of God. And that's where we're going to finish up today's lesson. Ananias and Sapphira were perfect examples of spiritual judgment in the body of believers. And I want to suggest to you this, that this is the protection by the hand of God to order this kind of judgment in the church. Because we are not to take any of those things set apart for destruction or we ourselves will be completely destroyed and will bring trouble on the camp of Israel, right? Going back to Joshua. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. The attitude and the behavior of Ananias and Sapphira had an inverse, ruinous effect on the people within the church, and God knew that there had to be a halt to this. There had to be something done in order to keep those people who were in the church, who were true believers in God, purified. 
Ananias and Sapphira were perfect examples of truly unconverted people. And they had to be made public spectacles of God's judgment and wrath. And it was for, can I suggest this? It was for the protection and the promotion of God's people and the propelling forward of the gospel message of Christ. The judgment of Ananias and Sapphira served as a means of deterring hypocrites from entering into the church because biblical church membership required, at this point in this early church, it required devotedness and Christ-likeness. And the truth is, that kind of service to God through the means of the capital C church will do one of three things. It will either attract the sincere, it will repel the counterfeit, or it will offend those who are deceived. Take a look with me at verse 13 again. It says this out of the New King James Version. It says, but no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. But yet take a look at what it says in verse 14. It says, yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Is this a contradiction here in the word of God? Not at all. Because the truth of the gospel message will do one of three things. It's either going to attract, it's going to repel, or it's going to offend. And in some we see that they were offended and they left. In some cases we see that they were repelled or they, were, they had an aversion to what was being spoken to them and to those who didn't really serve Christ at all, that was the truth. And in some we see that they were attracted True seekers of truth will find what they're looking for, and they will be brought closer as a result of their diligent pursuit. The judgment of Ananias and Sapphira served as protection, and it guarded the growing society from being corrupted in spirit as it increased in numbers. And yet, how typical it is in our modern day to see quite the opposite. Typically, what we see is that church increases in numbers as it decays in its devotion. Truth doesn't always grow numbers. Truth oftentimes attracts, it repels, or it offends. The answer for boldness in preaching came in the form of healing miracles. And this is what we see in chapter 4, verse 29. When Peter and John prayed, they said, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. And so that was the answer given to them by God. And that was an increase in the effectiveness that they had in healing miracles. Its purpose for those miracles was to embolden them in speaking the word of truth. And it was to attract those who were sincere in their faith and would naturally turn aside those who were imposters. And it was the case with Ananias and Sapphira. The truth will either repel and offend, or it will attract. Some will be repulsed by the truth of God, and that is just the bottom line. And they won't just say it with their mouths. They will live like they believe this is true with their very life. So when they hear a message preached from a purified church teaching truth, and they understand that there is to be no toleration of unfaithfulness or dishonesty or selfishness, worldliness or corruption, they will naturally be offended and they will leave. However, in some, there will be an awakening of their soul when they hear the truth and they recognize it as truth. There is something that compels them to be attracted to that truth. And those are the truly converted. Those are the true Christians walking with the Lord and seeking after holiness and righteousness and purity in their life. You see, I believe that this is the truth. When we can maintain incorruptible sincerity, and when we have a high spiritual purity in our life, when we, who are the people of God, live with an elevated standard of living because of the high price paid for us by a good and loving Savior, we will always 
genuinely attract people and gain a following from the multitudes, the masses within the mixed multitudes will always honor the church for what is pure and noble in their members. When people on the outside who aren't walking with Jesus see the purity of people that are formed and fashioned in a church that is seeking after purity and who is not tolerating the ugliness and the wickedness and the sinfulness of this world, then there will be a genuine attraction to that. And I believe with everything in me that people are seeking for truth. They no longer want a watered down gospel that even permits them to live a sinful life because it serves no good purpose to them spiritually. And what ends up happening is they die a premature spiritual death as a result. And then they find themselves in a place where they can't get back once they want once they had with the Lord because they have stepped away from him for too long and too far and they find themselves in a place where sometimes it's all and out apostasy and they simply can't recover from that this means friends this means that there is such an importance in a pastor of a church who is fully focusing on purifying the people within that church, teaching truth, commanding godliness, and exhorting righteousness. And we cannot, we cannot be representatives without this. We cannot be godly representatives for Jesus until we know this truth for ourselves and until we begin to live like Christ in the sin-sick world that we live in today. When there is this great awakening, when we have our eyes opened and there's this great awakening and many conversions as we see found in the book of Acts is happening, there comes with that tremendous responsibility. And that responsibility, it rests on our shoulders as believers in Jesus. And part of that responsibility is to know him, to love him, to be surrendered by him, to obey him, to faithfully be pursuing him all the days of our lives so that we can live a godly life and be godly representatives for him in a fallen world. The outpouring of God's judgment I want to say, as kind of my very last thing I'm going to say about this, the outpouring of God's judgment may be a preparation for the outpouring of his mercy. We can celebrate that this happened with Ananias and Sapphira as an example to us of the seriousness in which the purity of the church is seen through the eyes of God. Listen, the church was made to be kept and pure. And the deeper work of grace among the people of God, the larger work of the gospel to the world. We have a greater impact in the world around us when we refrain from evilness, when we obey God, and when we seek with everything in us to live with purity, righteousness, and holiness. The judgment and the subsequent deaths of Ananias and Sapphira is the goodness of the Lord revealed to deliver the body of believers in the capital C church from the consumption, which if left unchecked, will bring about ultimate premature death to the body of believers, those who say they're believers and they really are unconverted. The work of God, friends, listen, the work of God is to cast out the poison that would undermine the life and it serves as a shield to the church from the power of its enemies. Listen, it was the terror of the Lord in this situation, in the forming of this early church that effectually persuaded people to take refuge in his mercy. And I want to suggest to you today that if you are living as a believer 
in this modern day and age, if you are living in the capital C church and you are finding there to be so much frustration in the church that you are attending, it might be time, it might be time to find a new church one that is really about the protection of your soul, the edification of your soul. How deep are they teaching these truths? How much are they telling you that you need Jesus and that you have to make a decision on how you are living because it matters. It matters in this evil world. Listen, it's probably never mattered more like it matters in the current evil days that we are seeing today. So friend, I hope that this has been an encouragement to you today and I hope that this has given you enough information to go and look these Bible verses up for yourself so that you can understand this story and the scriptures within Acts 4 and 5 better for yourself. It's always my goal to give you enough information to get you interested in going deeper into your walk with Jesus for yourself. Listen, I love you. I am praying for you. I pray that if you like this video, that you would give it a huge thumbs up. And not only that, that you would share it with somebody else whom you know and love, and also that you would give me a comment down below and let me know how you appreciated this video. You know what else tells me that you appreciate this channel is by subscribing to this channel. Become a part of this growing family. This is the way that you can just say, thanks, Wendy, for the work that you are doing. Also, don't forget to hit that notification bell down below to be notified for every time that I upload content just like this one. I love you, friend. I am praying for you. And between now and my next video, I pray that you have an awesome day walking with Jesus. I love you, friends. Bye-bye.